and recent case law. Stephen. Thank you, uh, Clive, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, knew, I knew coming to a venue like this that I should have been an engineer. Um, so thank you, David, for, uh, for organising the event and the wonderful surrounds. Um, I need to work out how this works. I'm going to talk through um, some of the environmental risks. Um, there's been quite a lot of law in the, the, the couple of presentations that I've been able to see. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about categories of environmental liability, focusing on the criminal, which often focuses the, the mind, and the, some of the trends in enforcement, directors and officers' responsibilities, which will be relevant to you and also to your, to your clients and customers, um, ensuring that what you do helps them uh, stay themselves out of jail. A little bit about civil sanctions, just uh, em emerging trends in, in, in enforcement. Touch on the uh, ELD the, and uh, director's duties uh, quite specifically around environmental reporting. Into insurance as part of the risk management strategy. Um, touch on some cases, a some, uh, little bit of contaminated land case law. Um, I wasn't going to spend too long um, because I felt there would probably be an overlap with this morning's presentation um, on part 2A, but there'll be a few comments on the, on the new guidance, which I will make. It was, it was comforting that environmental law broadly escaped the, uh, the bonfire of regulations that the, the current government embarked on, which felt to me like a little bit of a, a reactionary policy. Better regulation, great, but there was a, quite a bit of talk about pulling back from uh, a number of very important developments that have taken decades often when we hear the glacial pace of change in, uh, in working through uh, asbestos and uh, guidance and so on, um, that, that's repeated elsewhere. So I think that it was interesting, it was comforting to me that there was a, a pretty significant public backlash, uh, the suggestion that we would just pull back from pretty stringent and well thought through environmental regulation. Um, as a lawyer, I do sometimes quite like it and we all work in a highly regulated industry. Um, so it's pretty, pretty important stuff. Um, this is a top view of a pyramid. And when we walk through this with our clients, just to get them comfortable or, or to understand some of the, uh, the, the range of environmental liabilities, I don't know if that's clear to you, but um, you know, we, we break it down into quite a few different, different areas, um, particularly with a contaminated land focus. So we have at the top you know, perception, um, which is hugely important to, to some of our clients. Um, some of the things we were discussing, clients, the, the, the CRC, Carbon Reduction Commitment, um, people were particularly concerned not to be at the bottom of the league table um, or, or at least be above their nearest uh, and most uh, violent competitors, um, which was a, a perception brand issue. Um, legal expenses is self-evident. Lawyers, whilst hugely good value, um, are, are an expense, um, which people would rather not spend their money on um, I can entirely understand that. Um, and the legal expenses there breaks down into you know, the costs of your, your lawyers and the, the expert in, in, input that you'd be requiring, third-party claims, the costs thereof, property damage claims, those sorts of things, through to the internal management and distraction costs um, that, 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 that any major re remediation project can, can entail. And then the actual costs of the remediation are off on the other side. Clients have got a variable enthusiasm um, to pay, obviously, and there, there are a, a real range of propensities to pay to manage risk, and what level of risk is, is acceptable will vary client to client, and sometimes quarter to quarter. There are so many criminal tripwires embedded in the universe of environmental law, um, and when, when you look at what that means for proceeds of crime, there are, there are an awful lot of tripwires which has some interesting imp implications we'll come on to with, uh, w when we look at insurance. The one thing that here, as I'm sure you agree, when you're, when you're dealing with criminal liabilities, um, water pollution as a part of the remediations, where it often comes up, but where, where we, we do look at the personal criminal liability of directors uh, and officers, the threat of Christmas away from the family and the loss of liberty is, is, is very much more, uh, has a greater propensity to, to scare the bejesus out of the clients that are looking at making hard decisions on spending money when it's not their money to spend. So it's one of those things that you know, does, does sometimes get a bit overused, but 
think the courts have started to um, be become increasingly uh, accepting of, and the, the regulators and the, pros uh, the, the prosecution authorities um, have, have looked more carefully at bringing actions against individuals who may be culpable. So that has been a, a, a general trend, I would say. Uh, so some of the offences, just as a recap, the permitting regs, um, there's, there's uh, unlimited fines potentially and up to five years imprisonment uh, available for the, the most serious offences. Um, the, some of the, the, the stats there, the, the EA have prosecuted uh, last year 178 companies for environmental offences and about £4 million in, in fines. Um, water and waste are significant um, statistically um, and increasingly water companies were those that were involved in I think 90% of the serious pollution incidents were water companies unsurprisingly um, I, I guess given what they do uh, we heard about uh, waste crime uh, on the increase as landfill costs have risen um, and the EA cracking down with a new unit um, look, looking to, uh, to pursue uh, waste offenders uh, th there must, however, be an impact of the fairly stringent you know, re recessionary-based uh, cuts in EA frontline uh, in enforcement policy, in enforcement personnel. So that, that's interesting to, to see how they can regulate more and more offences with less resource. Some of the levels of fines aren't themselves huge, whilst the trend's been upwards, it's just the, the water offences drifted up sort of £9,000 on average per offence um, th this last year um, compared to about five or six the, the year before. So there's there's an, an upwards trend, um, but they're still not huge when you're looking at the size of some of the, um, the, the regulated water businesses that are involved. So they're not necessarily huge incentives to, uh, to, to change behaviour. Um, there were in, in, embedded in there some, some fairly large penalties, Thames Water, um, got fined in 2011 for 200,000 for an offence that actually was relating to a spill in 2003, um, and there was 150,000 pounds for United Utilities. But these are big chunks of money, and you wouldn't want to pay it yourself, but to a large multi-million pound corporate, they're not necessarily the things that will drive uh, behaviour. Health and safety um, offences, um, pressure from the courts um, to, to push up the level of fines, and there's been some pretty strong guidance um, to the courts um, to, to push up the, the, the actual use of the fines. So obviously, they set the levels, but there's been pressure internally in the prosecution guidelines to, uh, and to, to the, the guidance to the, uh, the, the, the judges themselves to, to, to push these up. And it's interesting that, by and large, the way societal changes, we, we heard earlier Stephen mentioning the, uh, the acceptability of different levels of risk, reasbestos. I think that when you, when you look at um, how the courts and the, the legislature and then those within the, the system that, that enforce the law, they, they are influenced by the general societal ac level understanding of risk and the, the level of acceptability of risk. So there were some huge, entirely compliant, wonderfully successfully run businesses um, who w w were put out of business entirely because they happened to be making all their money out of slavery. Um, and, and these were, they would have passed with flying colours most internal governance uh, audits and so on of the day, even if run today. But they, they, they did become yeah, extinct by and large, excluding the, some of the, uh, the, 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 the ongoing issues there. But the point is, I'm trying to make quite badly is that you know, I think that the courts will follow societal drift. To, uh, to, to see certain behaviours as, as less acceptable. This is coming through in changes in governance in, in corporate law um, and the, the increase in yeah, the funds that are flowing into better run companies through uh, the CSR uh, programmes by larger corporates, but also the investment strategies of those that deploy capital. Civil sanctions, um, because there are so many criminal legal tripwires in, uh, in the UK, which is not necessarily uh, consistent with other developed nations, we, we have more criminal tripwires than, than, than others. Um, but the, the, the shift into civil sanctions, it's, it's taken a while. It's been talked about for, for very many years. Um, 2008, we've seen since then now 109 uh, enforcement undertakings from this new toolbox. Um, in enforcement undertakings, 99 of which have been for packaging waste, uh, what would have been uh, offences, now dealt with as civil sanctions. 
three for Water Resources Act pollution incidents, two for hazardous waste uh, offences, two for oil storage, and three for fisheries-related water pollution. And there were uh, some fixed penalties for water abstraction offences. So interesting that it's been so focused on some of those relatively, well, I shouldn't say this really, but relatively lower grade offences that have been dealt with in this, in this way cheaper for the, the EA to administer to, to some degree and better for the environment and charitable good causes because one of the, the, the fle feedback mechanisms is that uh, the, the money that comes in from the enforcement undertakings is fed back to environmental charities and, and good causes. So 130% um, of the cost saved in the non-compliance is, is, is taken from the company when they put their hands up and fed back. So that's destined to, to be reinvested to do other good things um, with a particular environmental bent. I think in uh, across 14, uh, there was one statistic I saw that across 14 undertakings, it was nearly £200,000 was, was raised for good causes, um, which, which was generally quite nice. Um, environmental Liability Directive um, creates a new head of of liability. Um, when we're talking about environmental insurance later, it's uh, n now pretty standard that your environmental insurance and environmental impairment liability will cover the additional heads of risk and, and liability that the ELD creates. Um, I won't go into too much detail on the on the ELD, but it's it, it, it's it's a another another area of additional cost when certain things go wrong. The, the director's duties um, I did want to, to touch on. Um, so the environmental permitting regs, uh, and, and historically environmental law has included um, uh, triggers by which directors can themselves be prosecuted and the, the same tests prevail here. So it's, it's with consent or connivance of an officer um, or where, where an offence is attributed to their neglect. Those are the, the routes by which an individual can be, become culpable. Um, and the, the officer, what is an officer in this situation, tends to be a um, senior member. So obviously, directors, management committee, chief execs, um, and those that would be in a sort of controlling mind capacity. It's been clarified that it's, it, it's really only those in a genuine position of real authority, and there's been some case law that's, that's tried to take on people who've been too junior, and the courts have pushed back on that. Uh, because it's, it's genuinely not meant to strike at, at mere employees of the organisation. It should be those that are really controlling. For uh, consent, con contrive, con connivance or neglect, um, it's the criminal test. So it's, it, it must be proven that that was with, uh, that consent was, or connivance was beyond reasonable doubt. Um, they don't need to prosecute the company to also prosecute the individual. Um, and put out in the notes, there's a, some better examples of the, what it might mean to consent or to connive. Another section 38, um, willful default. So the head in the sand approach um, is, is, is not, there is another route by which one can get in trouble for um, deliberately or, or willfully failing to do what one ought to in, in your position as a senior officer of the organisation. Uh, I just mentioned that it's, it's very rarely used. Um, Companies Act 2006. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot going through at the moment in terms of inc increasing transparency and reporting obligations. Um, it, it's been required for large companies, um, sorry, director duties, to act in a way that considers um, the company's impact on community and the environment. That's, that's something that has to be taken into a, a, account. Um, and there's pressure at the moment growing in terms of the corporate reporting and narrative reporting, not just to, to, to think that through and report it for large companies, but it, it's, that'll be pushed down to, to smaller non-listed companies uh, in due course. One thing I wanted to mention there is um, that the DEFRA uh, consulted in 2011 on mandatory greenhouse gas reporting um, from 2013, April, um, all quoted companies are going to have to report on their greenhouse gas emissions in the director's reports, and that's likely to be pushed out to all large companies, not just those which are listed, 
so yeah, large private, private equity control businesses uh, will fall within this, and it's expected that that will be pushed down to, to smaller companies in due course. I think one of the other trends we see in kind of general corporate governance is um, a bit more activism from the NGO community. There's a nice little NGO called Client Earth, um, who in 2010 basically said, what you're saying, Rio Tinto, in your reports is actually doesn't reflect the risk accurately. So if, I'm a, if I were an investor and I was reading your report, that does not reflect the risks actually which your business is subject to uh, and creates uh, on the environment. So they, they did challenge that. This wasn't an environmental case as such. It was through the, the, the financial reporting uh, regulators. Um, and they did have to you know, reissued and uh, have improved the reporting in, in that regard. And general trends on transparency is interesting. I was involved in a case recently where, for the first time ever, and I felt I was hanging with the kids on this one, I actually ended up doing my due diligence partly involving WikiLeaks. Now, Wikipedia is all very well, because we, we probably use that for most of the things we do all the time these days. But actually, we found some really useful information uh, on WikiLeaks about this particular business that we were involved in a transaction with, which was information we would never have been able to get um, from, a, from, from a buyer's perspective, um, ab absent Julian Assange and his, uh, his, his campaign. So the universe of environmental liabilities, a lot of the time will be involved with people in this room um, as part of the professional team advising on transactions. So uh, once you've identified the nature and extent of those risks which have been run, whether it's corporate responsibility uh, for you know, clean-up costs or director's uh, duties or asbestos exposures, those sorts of things, and it's on a transactional basis, you'll be looking at a range of different things that one can do with that information. Um, there's a, a, a range of different tools and strategies that, that one would expect. So the contracts will include you know, warranties and indemnities quite often. Um, uh, the Part 2A language, specifically if you're transacting land or businesses, the agreements on liability and some of those other tr transfer tests to enable a, a buyer and a seller to, uh, to shift liability between themselves. So I wanted just to focus on one being uh, environmental insurance. Um, because I've used it quite recently on a couple of cases. And there's a, quite a large number of, I think there's 13 insurers now in, uh, in the UK that will write um, environmental risk business. Um, not all of those will do very big and long-term policies, but they are covering environmental risks. Um, so it's a, it's a hungry market. Keen for, uh, keen for premium, so I've actually felt that a couple of sites, specific sites or portfolios of businesses that we've taken to the insurance markets recently, given the level of risk and the level of anxiety on, on the transaction on one side or the other, usually the person who's being asked to hold on to liability trying to sell the business, um, in, in my recent experience, um, it, it's felt like very good value indeed um, to, to, to look at environmental liability. But on, on the insurance side, a couple of things. One, this slide talks about effectively the, the ability to use the insurance as a, co as a cost recovery tool. It's a huge business in the US. There's a, any number of large law firms who've um, got, got, got very rich on uh, taking claims against insurers for historically covered risks. Um, you know, creeping contamination through Superfund, those sorts of things. In the UK, there's less track record. Um, there's um, whether there is this, this is this is all about uh, dealing with a, a site today that's got historic got contamination, but the contamination may have built up over decades. Um, there haven't been many cases, but there have been a couple of settlements of, of cases. There have been no reported cases, um, but there've been settlements where the one of the, the loss paying party has managed to access the insurers who insured the business for that 30, 40, 50 year period um, and s sought a contribution to the costs from, from that insurer. It's, it's quite complicated and quite expensive to do because you need to find the policies, you need to check what coverage is available. There's normally lots of different policies that you need to find. Um, they will have different levels of cover available, different exclusions, so it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle process. But if you can tot it all together, if it's for a big enough claim, it's worth exploring whether there may be a cost recovery action available to you. I think, generally speaking, I think you wouldn't bother unless it was a multi-million pound um, clean-up operation. Um, but it's, for the right case, it's worth doing. There are a subspecies. Are there any insurance archaeologists in the room? There aren't many insurance archaeologists ever uh, anywhere, but the, the, the individuals who will trawl through um, very dusty old policies um, to try and identify which insurer covered which corporation 
uh, for which year and what, what, what were the limits available. Um, so it's a, r rare but worth bearing in mind for the right sites. But more traditionally, um, the environmental insurance as we would know it today, um, it's, uh, so it's a increasingly accepted by buyers and sellers or financial uh, institutions as a, as, as a valid tool for transferring risk. Yeah, the buyer doesn't want it, the seller won't take it, but an insurance company is game to take it on in return for the right level of premium. Um, increasingly a competitive market, as I mentioned. Typically, the environmental impairment liability will be, I typically see these on transactions where you'd be looking to buy a policy which may last uh, for maximum these days is, is 10 years, but Back in the day, you could get 25-year policies. Um, cost cap policies, which would allow you a sort of wrapper around a, a specific remediation program, not really available these days um, too much. Uh, there have been a few claims on, on, a, on a small number of policies, so the, the insurers are priced themselves really out of that market. Um, warranty and indemnity um, transactional insurance is uh, in increasingly used. Contractors' pollution liability for you guys in the room. Um, I think some clients have um, sought CPL policies as a as a wrap to ensure that the entire professional team um, and and all the contractors and subcontractors have a an insurance uh, wrapper um, to ensure that you know there's as little daylight between and you don't need to end up in the event of a claim litigating amongst multiple parties with their advisors and their insurers' advisors and it gets very complicated. So better to have a pot of cash, which is one insurer making this available to cover any of the risks that happen on a particular policy. I think I've just mentioned at the bottom there's climate change policies. You know, that there are carbon credit guarantees that are being devised. Any other renewable energy project, um, you know, lots of things can go wrong. There are some of the underwriters have started to wrap specific policies for those kinds of markets, which will be increasingly relevant in, in your businesses, I'm sure. Five minutes to go. Um, characteristics of these policies, um, typically you need to make sure your broker, if you're looking at advising on these policies or, or, or you're on a transaction where they are relevant. It's, it's an interesting process, but it's very iterative. The, the environmental consultants are very heavily involved in the process of placing the insurance, in my experience. You typically need the, the, the insurance broker to be sitting there with the technical guy and the legal guy to make sure that the client's needs are all being met. And it tends to be, uh, tends to be quite good fun. Has, has, has anyone been involved in uh, a situation where environmental insurance has been used or has been acquired for a particular environmental risk? Okay, a few, a few. That's pr probably reflective. It's, it's, it's not so common, um, but it's increasingly accepted, I would say. There's a pile of limitations and you need to be very careful. Some of the key ones from our perspective are, um, you, know, you generally can't go digging uh, to look for, um, there's a voluntary site investigation is often an, usually an exclusion. Um, uh, and you wouldn't normally get to cover it if you do vo uh, a voluntary act. A redevelopment of your site would normally preclude recovery under the insurance, but there are a few. There's a bit of uh, work that can be done to give you some protection in the event of an, uh, a development. And the big claim exclusion that I mentioned just at the bottom is, is the one that you can't read anywhere in the policy, but if it's a big enough claim, they'll find a way to fight you all the way. Um, which is why you do need to be a little bit careful just in terms of working through the, the policy wording. Parkway Statue Gardens, um, this was going to be a, a main focus of the talk, but hearing from David um, from the horse's mouth, there wasn't, I think, an awful lot I was going to add. I like the fact that it's shorter, so 67 pages down from 190, that's good. Um, the guidance not to be overly precautious to, to the, uh, the enforcing, enforcing authorities is useful, and the re-emphasis on innocent till proven guilty. I like the fact that one of the hard edges that I always found quite difficult to bear um, was that if, if there's an inspection and there is no contamination uh, identified or the land is not contaminated, um, the local authorities should state that and state that clearly to avoid that you know, risk of uh, you just didn't find it. Um, and, and once remediated, then you should again expect a written statement from the local authority that this is no longer contaminated land, again, use, useful. I think from the consultant perspective, um, it, there's a strong endorsement for, to local authorities to use external experts, which is obviously good for you. But there was one lovely comment in there, which I'll read. It was, it was saying, when choosing specialist consultants, local authorities should strive as far as possible 
to ensure that they are appropriately qualified and competent to undertake the work. I, get, I don't think you'd have guessed that that was the sort of criteria they were using when they were looking for their expert advice. Um, I think uh, attendance at the One Day Risky Business Seminar may not be sufficient in itself to qualify you, but the fact that you are here, uh, I think, will go, go some way to suggest that that's the work that you should be uh, comfortable chasing. It's taken nine years as well for the contaminated land uh, re regime now to incorporate the significance test in, in, in water, which is, I think, very useful. I, I would still say we don't know... Um, what it's going to take to be a knowing permitter. We're no further forward there. It was a useful opportunity to potentially clarify what, how much knowledge is sufficient to make you a knowing permitter. It would have been useful to get a bit of a steer on that um, and how much knowledge is required in order to transfer liability on a sold with information test. That, that would have been useful. Still complex. Um, there's still a very large number of enforcing authorities. Still a lot of local authorities with very little experience who will be bamboozled and won't know what, where to go necessarily. Um, and it's still arguably a relatively unfair regime because if, if back in the day when you were cleaning up the first time you have applied with best practice, you took all the guidance that was available to you from all those people um, in authority who were there to guide you um, and you, you did what was required then, um, you can still be forced to go back and reopen. So that uh, in some cases is, is unfair. I will just mention a couple of cases. One... An, ins an insurance case, but not a contaminated land case, Safeway and Trigger. This was a situation where the OFT imposed a multi-million pound fine on Safeway in respect of a competition law issue. Um, Safeway sought to recover the fine from its directors and employees, um, and there was a DNO policy, a directors and officers insurance in place. But their court of appeal, um, there had been basically daily discussions of pricing, which is very much not what you're meant to do if you're a large retailer. Um, it's price fixing. Um, but the Court of Appeal held that, um, that the claim against um, the directors was barred because it infringed. There was a lovely uh, legal Latinism, ex terpi causa, that a person who committed an illegal or unlawful act can't benefit from that effectively. Um, and effectively, what that meant was that that maxim would not be limited in a DNO context by some of the wording in the, in the, in the case and the judgment, but it could apply to P&I cover. So in a scenario where you're involved in some active on-site uh, investigations and uh, that, 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 that fatal scenario, you're, you're, you're drilling down through a perched contaminated groundwater and you uh, create a new pathway and uh, there's a leach into the, the major aquifer. There's a, there's a de facto crime there because it's water pollution, strict liability, bang to rights. Um, the, on the application of the Safeway case, there's a, an argument that the insurers could run that actually, because it was a criminal act that you did that created that risk and that loss, that actually your insurance won't be applicable, which could apply to PI um, coverage and could also apply to the environmental insurance policy we touched on just a minute ago. So that's one to watch. I'm going to have, have, have fun in, in the near future talking that through with some of the environmental brokers um, and some of the underwriters to see how they intend to respond, if at all, to, to, to that particular development. Um, and the only other one I think was worth mentioning, there's a, at the bottom there, Chandler and Cape, which was a 2012 Court of Appeal decision, um, which basically said that a parent company can owe a direct duty of care to the employees of a subsidiary. This doesn't pierce the corporate veil, which basically protects, it says that a corporation, um, you, you can't work your way up through one corporate to another corporate. In this case, um, there'd been asbestos exposure to an employee of the subsidiary. Subsidiary had then ceased to exist, but because of the, uh, the, the parent company's uh, knowledge and active engagement with the uh, the health and safety approach adopted at, across the group and in that subsidiary, they'd accepted a, a duty of care and a responsibility for that employee, even though it was not their employee, but an employee of their subsidiary. So that, that's, uh, that's an interesting development, um, and it, that, that'll broaden out, actually. It will give other claimants heart um, to bring some what would have other, otherwise been harder to reach um, actions. I think, uh, in conclusion, if you risk running and tripping over any criminal wires in your day-to-day -day activities, do, I think, check 
you contract carefully and do check your, your, your PI and the terms of your PI. And it's worth maybe having a word with whoever looks at the risks and your, the way you manage those risks organisationally and just ask the question about that Sainsbury's case just to see whether um, you can get a little bit of comfort that that's something that they, they wouldn't seek to try and use against you in anger. Thank you. Thank you.